I can, should I get started? Yep, absolutely. All right, so welcome everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. I see somebody, uh, some, uh, uh, we have audience from uh, overseas, so welcome. Gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. It's his 10th anniversary now uh, with us. Uh, Kai, it's, time flies, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kai Ming Fu, uh, who's gonna talk to us today about the Cornell experience and spine analytics and spine outcomes. Now, Kai joined us 10 years ago. He's the chief of neurosurgery at Lower Manhattan Hospital. He's the uh, chief of deformity surgery here at the Cornell campus. Uh, Kai did his undergraduate studies at Stanford Medical School at Einstein and then his uh, residency at the University of uh, Virginia, followed by a spine fellowship with Chris Shaffrey in deformity surgery, tumor and reconstructive complex spine surgery. And then he joined us and uh, uh, it's, uh, he's always been involved heavily with uh, a number of spine organizations really globally. Uh, I think mostly with uh, the Scoliosis Research Society and there are many, many publications that have his name uh, in relationship to uh, deformity surgery, but also minimally invasive spine surgery. He was very uh, involved in, and still is involved in the QOD database that we've been participating with in, in neurosurgery. Uh, within Ox Spine now, he is uh, very involved with uh, the uh, next generation database that we're working on, uh, that we're going to be participating with. So it's only fitting that he's going to talk to us today about his work, his experience uh, with outcomes uh, related research and uh, outcomes related to spine surgery, focusing on, on the Cornell experience. So, so Kai, th thanks for doing this and uh, at short notice, and uh, we're really excited to have you. Thanks. Thanks, Ro thanks Roger, and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I, I like the opportunity to present what we've been working on for 10 years, and this is myself as well as involves some of the efforts of Dr. Virk, uh, Ibrahim Hussein, and, and Jacob Goldberg. So uh, this will be an overview of some of the stuff that we've done, um, and I'll just give a little bit of background. Uh, most of us know that you know spine disease is very common, number one. Uh, uh, is the third highest volume of complaints in primary care behind diabetes and heart disease. It will probably affect all of us at some point over our lifetime. Uh, we do know, if you've seen our uh, grand rounds, as, as other people have, that there's variability in treatments. Um, and, you know, everybody seems to approach the same problem with different techniques. What's best is not really clear. Um, and most of the evidence is anecdotal. I've always done it this way and everybody has done great is sort of the statements that we normally hear. So it's really been based a lot on expert opinion and more so over the last 15 years or so, I think uh, a higher quality information has uh, been coming out. And I think you know, some of that has been useful in decision-making. And you know, one of the big things we have is that we don't have a lot of randomized control trials and those that are out there are somewhat controversial. Uh, they're definitely difficult to perform um, and really what we've been focusing on is analysis of our outcomes from current practice and then combining these with current practice from other centers and other surgeons to try to get a, a better understanding of uh, how patients do with different techniques. And there are some benefits of this. You know, we allow for multi-center, multi-surgeon uh, uh, studies. Um, we have large numbers possible due to this. Um, and we can study multiple variables, both preoperatively and postoperative outcomes wise. Some of the negatives on this is that the outcomes measures that we ana analyze are very, um, are tools that have been developed and have been uh, analyzed, but they're not perfect. And they have varying levels of accuracy on uh, how the outcomes really are. And sometimes the numbers may look good and the patients may not feel they had a good outcome. So there's always discrepancies with that. And then also population analysis is really currently not optimal for identifying the uh, best treatment for a specific individual. And I think there's work coming along with that, with you know, some people working on machine learning, some people working on, on different ways of plugging in um, your preoperative variables to determine what is your most likely uh, post-operative outcome from different techniques. And again, uh, we're not quite there yet. 
So what is our experience here? Well, over the last decade, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to participate in several uh, major study groups, really two of them, looking at different aspects of spine surgery. The first uh, that uh, Roger alluded to is the ISSG, which stands for International Spine Study Group. Um, and it's really a deformity working group that started about uh, 15 years ago. And I had the ability to join after I, I worked with Dr. Shaffrey. And this is a group that looks at uh, deformity. And initially it was only open deformity, but I've been looking at mostly MIS deformity with some of the thought leaders in that group over the last uh, eight or nine years. And so this has been a really a great place to, to meet with people who are at the forefront of lateral type uh, surgeries, especially and you know ALL release uh, surgeons. We've also met with people that do uh, MIS, uh, minimally invasive uh, PSOs and osteotomies. And then just people trying to push the envelope and determine what actually works uh, with less invasive deformity. Um, the next group that I've also been working at concurrently is with the uh, QOD, which has now been sort of renamed Spine Core as QOD has morphed into the ASR. And this is really focused on degenerative spine disease. And there's been three uh, working groups, uh, the oldest one being the lumbar grade one spondylolisthesis, uh, which we put in a lot of patients for, including both our fused and uh, patients who only received a laminectomy. Uh, we also have looked at cervical myelopathy in the cervical QOD. And then I've had the, uh, the honor to work on as the lead site on the grade two or three spondylolisthesis study, which is looking at slightly uh, different and more uh, progressed spondylolisthesis than the grade one degeneratives. And so with these uh, working groups, we've been able to be very productive. And the QED study group really is still going. And with the lumbar only, we pretty much put out 20 manuscripts. I think one of them may be cervical. And so there's probably another 20 manuscripts out there uh, with, from various sites that we're involved in, including the cervical. And then now we have several in the high-grade spondylolisthesis group that are almost ready to go. And then again, the ISSG study group, um, we've had 10 manuscripts, including a couple really uh, nice manuscripts on uh, MIS decision-making, uh, which I'll present a little bit later. And again, I think, you know, the beauty of these study groups is that there's a lot of uh, work to go around and it allows uh, people to get their um, in and, uh, and participate with organized neurosurgery. And so, you know, I've had the opportunity to involve Dr. Virk, um, Dr. Hussein and Dr. Goldberg in this, and it's been uh, uh, quite a pleasure to see them progress in their, uh, in their academic career. So again, I think we'll just start with the ISSG uh, projects regarding uh, MIS deformity. This is the first one. This was actually presented recently by Ib uh, over at the uh, Global Spine Congress. And um, sorry, this is. Nobody. Uh, hold on a second. Apologize. Just make this big. So uh, again, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, MIS, uh, inter minimally invasive interbody selection algorithm. And this is something that we developed and uh, Ibrahim wrote up for us um, to look at sort of a rationale for how we uh, uh, pick different inner bodies. And so um, here you can see is um, the uh, uh, paper that came out of this, and this was recently published last year um in the JNS spine and again the background is that really MIS deformity and a lot of MIS surgery is really based on inner body arthrodesis in order to get the fusion but also to get indirect decompression and reconstruction and it's really the the uh, uh the base for any kind of adult spinal deformity surgery so this algorithm was really developed to try to provide a framework for rational decision-making uh, in uh, MIS uh, deformity uh, so that uh, a lot of uh, practitioners who are approaching uh, adult deformity and using MIS techniques, maybe for the first couple times, have a rational way of approaching which uh, technique they may use. And so we looked at a, a surgeries from 11 surgeons uh, with 100 surgeries and 338 levels 
roughly between uh, 2015 and 2018. Hi, can you enlarge it so that you're playing the slideshow or just seeing the, the preview? Yeah, I think the problem with the slideshow, it's got some kind of uh, narration. Which oh, I, okay, got it. Which I can't really get rid of. Um, I think, see that play narrations on the top? Maybe if you could unclick that. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Okay, we'll go back to. Uh, just so we could see your size. Thank you. So again, this is 11 surgeries, 100 uh, surgeries for adult smile deformity with 338 inner body device between 2015, 2018. We looked at uh, the different choices. And again, these will also depend on the level. But as you can see here in this uh, uh, diagram, we looked at lateral um, surgery uh, or la anterior lateral surgery. We looked at T lifts and we looked at uh, A lifts. And then the ACR stands for anterior column release, which is basically a more aggressive lateral uh, inner body fusion where the anterior uh, longitudinal ligament is released in order to uh, gain increased uh, um, lordosis. We did classify this in the lumbar spine between L1 and S1, and we measured pre and post operative. Um, We measured pre and post operative um, segmental lordosis at each level. And we looked at uh, pre and post operative clinical outcomes uh, over the, uh, the years. This was our patient population, the mean age of 65, um, about 70% uh, uh, female with a BMI of 27.8 and a mean preoperative ODI of 50, which is uh, pretty significantly uh, uh, disabled. And then we had a mean follow-up range of about 40 uh, months. If we look at um, uh, what we, uh, let's, let's go back here. And that, um, if we look at um, what we did um, at each level, you can see here that at L1-2, uh, the lateral inner body fusion was, was the most commonly employed. And this makes sense from an anatomical standpoint. L23 and L34 also significantly uh, uh, utilized the lateral um, approach. ACRs were used at L3 and L4 and L23 um, in a minority because this is a more aggressive technique um, and only certain uh, more advanced lateral surgeons will use it. Um, and then the, uh, really at L45, uh, there's a number of different options, including the lateral, T-lift, and A-lift. And then again, uh, T lift and A lift predominated L5 S1. So we looked at the results from this and we found that segmental lordosis increased the most with ACR at L23. And then also at L34 had a very large uh, increase. So ACR was very effective for increasing the lordosis. A lift was very effective at L45 and L5 S1 for increasing lordosis. And then uh, T lift or posterior only inner body was really only uh, good for arthrodesis and did not get significant lordosis restoration at any level, but maybe good for uh, focal decompression if that's uh, one of the issues of, in the, uh, the patient is suffering from. So from this, we kind of developed a slightly uh, uh, busy, but uh, this is meant to be uh, uh, an algorithm which you can employ if you're approaching this sort of for the first time. And you can look at, you know, if you, what are your goals? And if your goals is height restoration, lordosis, uh, you trend towards the lateral or the uh, ACR um, or the a lift. And if you're, uh, depending on the level, and if your goal is really um, to have a decompression or arthrodesis, the T-lift is a benefit because it's one uh, approach as opposed to uh, two different approaches. And it also affords a, a very good arthrodesis uh, capability. So based upon this, this is the algorithm that we, we uh, used and IB has uh, presented on this internationally and has been uh, uh, very well received as a really a, a way to synthesize sort of best practices that are currently done uh, in a uh, more um, rational manner. We also looked at this earlier for MIS deformity and in general, as opposed to just the inner bodies and this has really been borne out by some of the stuff that Dr. Harrell's done here, and I've had the ability to learn here. 
um, which is you know MIS approaches for advanced, more complex um, uh, spine patients, including those with deformity, those with previous uh, surgeries who don't have landmarks. So a lot of this has really come about with uh, some of the advances in the techniques over the last decade, especially advances in techniques in navigation and interoperative imaging, both the arrow and here is a uh, ISOC, but we also use a Zeme uh, C arm, which is uh, allows us to get interoperative pictures that really approximate uh, a CT scan and allow us to know the work we've done is is uh, been safe and effective. And so, in 2014, looking at this, uh, a lot of people were doing deformity surgery, um, and they were trying to employ minimally invasive techniques. And there really wasn't. There's two different camps. You had an MIS surgeons who were trying to do deformity. Um, and they didn't maybe have the same knowledge of deformity as the deformity surgeons who were trying to do MIS, who maybe didn't have the same amount of knowledge of MIS. So this was really uh, felt to be a concern as that maybe some patients were being chosen for less invasive techniques that weren't optimized for that. So uh, you know, the working group decided to look at a way to rationalize uh, decision-making for MIS deformity. And this is back in 2014. And this is what we came up with after um, uh, two rounds of, uh, uh, of a modified uh, Delphi experience. And basically it allowed us to apply uh, uh, typical and accepted at the time uh, techniques for analyzing deformity and apply them into uh, uh, decision-making. And based upon this, we came up with three classes of patients and really any patient with significant sagittal imbalance or truly significant um, kyphosis or very large uh, coronal deformity ended up in the open category, which was class three, and were not treated with any kind of uh, MIS surgery. As we progressed, this is sort of like one of the things that could be done at the time. Very good for uh, coronal deformity that was mild. As you see here, improved coronal deformity in, in uh, figure B but not really any significant sagittal deformity uh, that required a lot of sagittal plane reconstruction. And so this was sort of the limits back in 2014, but over time with advances in, um, again, technique, advances in inner body, um, and advances in uh, the uh, navigation capabilities of uh, most systems, uh, it was really felt that this should be revisited. And so then this was revisited again several years later with an updated algorithm. And this really tried to take into uh, account some of the more uh, understood ideas of um, spine deformity and applying them to MIS. And so in this case, uh, you know, again, this was again done with a, a, an expert Delphi situation where we uh, po uh, sort of worked on it with uh, many members of both the MIS and deformity uh, societies. We came up with this uh, um, algorithm, which is basically designed to be a rational framework for working through a patient who you may consider for an MIS deformity. And again, we start with whether or not you're fused or rigid, because if you are, you're pretty much leading towards uh, an open surgery, which again now is class four. And the biggest change here is that we added a class three, which uh, now is an, actually a more aggressive MIS approach. So this would be circumferential MIS. So this is somebody who had a lateral or an A-lift who had, or T-lift who also had uh, percutaneous instrumentation as opposed to open instrumentation. And so again, here, this takes into account a lot of the sagittal plane uh, issues, including sagittal balance, pelvic tilt. The lumbar lordosis and PI mismatch is uh, really the difference between where your lumbar lordosis is and what we think it should be based upon the uh, uh, orientation of your pelvis. And then also the coronal cob, which is a standard scoliosis measure of curvature. So again, this kind of is, can be you know, demonstrated by you know, more this, this picture here where we see uh, somebody who has a more uh, extensive and longer um, uh, deformity surgery done with a circumferential um, MIS techniques. So to pivot now and also demonstrate some of the stuff we've done with the quality outcomes database, uh, it's now contained within the American Spine Registry. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the, the uh, topics I've been working on with um, 
some of the uh, uh, residents and past fellows and upcoming um, and current faculty, which is the high grade spinal anesthesis outcomes uh, project. And this is really a nice multi-center study, uh, which will have the largest number of patients for grade two and grade three spinal anesthesis uh, that's been looked at. And so this is uh, overall sort of our, our follow-up rates and the number of patients you have. You can see we have about 411 patients, including people from uh, various sites, uh, uh, most of them uh, very prevalent and uh, with very good surgeons. And you can see here, we have a very good follow-up rate at 24 months, which will allow us to, to really get some information on which patients and how they do with uh, surgical treatment of this uh, problem. And so uh, we've looked at a couple of issues that we've been able to, to come with this data. And we have a lot more that we're gonna be able to look at now that we've reached a 24 uh, month level where we can look at really true outcomes that are longer term. And we can look at um, a lot of uh, other issues, um, including uh, some that are presented here. Uh, this one here is a, a very uh, initial analysis of some of the factors associated with uh, prolonged length of stay after surgery for these uh, uh, types of surgeon, uh, spondylolisthesis. We uh, have about 400 patients that we've analyzed. Uh, we had about 370 who had grade two and about 30 who had grade three. And we had uh, most of them having uh, about one level of surgery, basically the level of, of um, that was the main issue. And we found the overall median length of stay was three days. Uh, with the range uh, here of two to four on average. Uh, we looked at different what, things that may be associated with a longer length of stay. Uh, some of the factors included scoliosis, uh, kyphosis, uh, depression, um, uh, which is often overlooked, uh, the psychological overlay. We looked at uh, the ability to uh, have two stages that often led to longer length of stay. We looked at the number of levels, uh, um, as well as OR time, and then uh, baseline uh, disability. Um, some of the things that were associated with shorter stay included an MIS inner body, and this is consistent with previous studies, especially ones that Roger's done that shows that an MIS approach can often lead to uh, uh, quicker initial healing. And so when we looked at a multivariable logistic regression, uh, we found that the odds of a longer length of stay are greater than five uh, days was really uh, a multi-approach procedure with an anterior posterior. And this may also reflect the fact that the, uh, the pathology here is uh, more significant or a little bit more uh, difficult. Um, we also found that uh, preoperative uh, scoliosis, uh, which is if it's concurrent with the uh, spondylolisthesis, can also lead to a length of stay that's increased. And then again, any time that more than one level uh, and usually more than two levels needs to be done, that really does lead to a progressively uh, increased length of stay. We also looked at uh, factors associated with non-routine discharge after surgery. Uh, and this is basically for people that went to a, a different uh, site than expected. This could be um, uh, a discharge to um, uh, you know, home, which was normal, or home with healthcare services was considered normal, but uh, post-acute or non-acute care uh, um, settings, such as a, 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 um, a SNF or a nursing home, these were uh, felt to be uh, non-routine. And we looked at uh, these patients again uh, with uh, the same average, a little bit more patients this time based upon the initial analysis. Um, that were found, and we found that uh, overall, we had a, um, a uh, non-routine discharge rate of about 15% uh, of those patients, with uh, 61 going to a, uh, a uh, uh, acute rehab or a uh, non-acute rehab uh, location. And I think four were transferred to another hospital for other care, and that may be from a uh, small community hospital to a, a, a tertiary care center. And we found that these patients who uh, had uh, non-routine discharge were more likely to be older, have diabetes uh, or another significant uh, comorbidity. Uh, depression, again, it really factored in. 
And then any type of deformity, such as kyphosis, really added to the, uh, to the, um, the uh, issue. And again here, insurance through Medicare really just corresponds most likely with older age. So when we looked at it on a multivariable logistic regression, we found that there's higher odds of non-routine discharge for patients in the upper uh, uh, part, uh, third of age, greater than 67 years old. We found that people in the, uh, with larger BMIs, kyphosis, and then chronic renal disease are more likely to have a, a non-routine discharge. And then we found that uh, patients, again, who underwent MIS approaches uh, really did have uh, uh, less likelihood of having a uh, non-routine discharge. So again, a lot of this is confirming what we kind of suspect from our um, practice, but it's good information to know for counseling for patients, uh, what they can expect if they undergo one of these procedures, especially if they have known kidney disease uh, based upon their age and other comorbidities. So we have a lot of active ongoing studies with this 24 month uh, database. We're really looking now, I think Jacob's looking at this with predictors of, of return to work. One of the biggest factors that a lot of employers have who pay for health insurance is how do we get people back to work? And we're trying to look at that um, to provide that information. We're looking at uh, a more comprehensive minimally invasive versus open out approach on the outcome measures such as disability, as well as leg and back pain. We're also looking at long-term outcomes from posterior versus combined approaches. Um, we're also looking at uh, the economics or cost effectiveness by approach, and this will be done with the qualities that we can calculate at the two-year data point. And then again, we're looking also at long-term outcomes by what is the predominant preoperative symptom. Is it leg pain, is it back pain, or is it you know, a 50-50 combination of both? And uh, how do people do based upon that and the surgery that's decided for them? So I want to thank uh, everybody for allowing me to speak on this. I want to acknowledge the uh, other members of the International Spine Study Group and the Quality Outcomes uh, Study Group at QOD. I also want to really uh, say a, a big thank you to Ibrahim and Jacob, who've done a lot of work on this, especially Ibrahim, who worked on the uh, uh, MISA, as well as the uh, MISDEF2, as well as uh, some of the QOD work and Jacob, who's been uh, really instrumental at uh, getting this high-grade QOD uh, study off the ground. So thank you very much. Hey, Kai, thank you so much. I, I had a question. Were you able to differentiate between minimally invasive and open approaches in that great uh, yeah, so we have, I think I understand your question, Roger, you kind of broke up, but I think we have uh, a pretty good way of doing that. We do have self-reporting from the, uh, the uh, sites on, on what the uh, techniques they've used. And we have uh, started working with uh, UCSF on the ability to actually take the pre and post-operative x-rays and analyze them so we can confirm that uh, the, the patients were treated in the way uh, MIS versus open. Hey, I thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it was wonderful as um, it's great that you're doing all this work and getting so many people involved. I just had a question sort of for, for young attendings and for the residents in terms of how you got involved with this and maybe some advice on, on how to become involved with projects like this uh, on, you know, a national, international level. Sure. I mean, again, a lot of this is uh, related to um, um, sort of the small world of neurosurgery. So I had the benefit of working with Chris Shaffrey, who was in these groups, and he offered me the opportunity to, to help with some of these projects. And so the more you get involved, which I hope Ibrahim and Jacob will see, the more you get involved and people will, will ask you to help with other projects. And this has definitely happened with, you know, uh, uh, I think Dr. Virk is very involved. And it's just basically the more you're, you're around, the more you'll uh, you get asked to be involved. And I think that uh, the biggest thing is to make, take advantage of every interaction you have, every meeting you go to and try to uh, meet people and try to uh, uh, demonstrate interest in, in, in working on these projects. Because 
there's always room for more people on these multi-center projects, um, especially uh, centers that are able to, to get the data, um, uh, which we're fortunate to be one of those centers. Thank you. Kai, it's great to see, it's Mike. Uh, it's great to see uh, the evolution of this and how far it's come uh, in, in the last you know, decade uh, since you know you and the, and the larger groups have been working on this. Um, so we're, we're kind of on this, this point of transitioning from this nice nimble group, the QOD and Spine Corps, which has, you know, a lot of representation, you know, rural, urban, academic, private, ortho, neuro, um, everyone, you know, there's a, there's a really nice cross section of people contributing. And now we're kind of making this push to move to the American Spine Registry, which is a, you know, really a, a colossal undertaking. Any thoughts about you know, the feasibility of these studies and how things are going to change as we as we move to a much bigger group? Are we going to be able to pull this off with the same, um, I don't know, level of acuity that, we're, that you're currently asking all these questions in? Or is this going to be diluted? And do we need to keep these smaller groups running? Because we're kind of bumping up against just feasibility, right? I mean, how many databases, how many groups can we keep going with this level of fidelity? Any, any thoughts on that transition? and whether or not these studies are going to be able to be, I, I think, as, as clean as they are now? Well, I, I think that's a very good question, Mike. And I think the more things change, the more they stay the same. So the name has changed to the study group. Uh, the makeup has changed a little bit around the edges, but the core groups that have done most of the work are still there. So the Mayo, the you know Carolinas, the uh, Sens Murphy, the Indianas, you know the UCSF, they're all still part of that group. And I think that overall, you know, in the bigger uh, deformity or bigger spine registry, there'll be a, uh, a place for a carve out for uh, the uh, people that want to really perform this analysis at a high level with high follow-ups. And even the ASR is designed so that uh, places can decide how much they want to participate. It can be just initial quality data and it could be initial three month follow-up and then it can be uh, as long as you know five year follow up, and you get graded sort of on which uh, how much you want to put in, and based on how much you put in, you get the ability to ask questions. And then again, the ability to ask questions is is a uh, is a formalized process now, which goes through a committee, which for now I happen to sit on, and then based on that you get the data. So it's more likely than not that a group that has had a previous track record, such as the spine core group, who are most of them are participating in the ASR, will be able to continue with their uh, analysis of uh, the topics that they would like to now analyze. So essentially, it, it, it's the, the same subdivisions will exist. We'll have access to more data, but you think that this is just going to go on as it, as it is based on participation, engagement, and, and there'll be these small groups within the much bigger group. I, I do think so for the time being, because even though the ASR is much better staffed with the uh, AAOS infrastructure as well as the AANS infrastructure, it really isn't yet to the point, as you know, that the database, you can just enter in something and get information out. It requires a lot of manpower to make sure the data is correct and the uh, actual uh, uh, stuff you're looking at is cleaned and uh, ready to be mined. Great. Yeah, Kai, just, just in, in context, maybe for the others too, the ASI is essentially the continuation of a lot of these databases, right? And it's really a central part, a central pillar of the integration within Arc Spine, within the spine, you know, the spine programs, Columbia Cornell, uh, to uh, make sure that we have a way to track outcomes and contribute to research and quality assurance and so forth. Kai, you showed a slide uh, towards the beginning uh, about TILA surgery versus anterior approaches, ASR, the indications, uh, like an algorithm. I, I thought that was really that was really nice. That was published, correct? Yeah, both the uh, MISA and MISDEF uh, uh, algorithms have published. So there's three publications on those, the MISDEF-1, the MISA, and the MISDEF-2. So they've all been published um, in the Journal, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine, um, and have been uh, relatively well received. That's great. Well, Kai, it's amazing. It's great to have somebody with your background and with your involvement nationally and internationally as part of our group, you know, and it's, 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 it's wonderful that you uh, were able to talk to us about 
the work that you've been doing, you know, together with all the other individuals and organizations. So I really appreciate that. Thanks for having me, Roger. And thanks for having me, Rupa. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Kai. Thanks.